Prophet Elijah and the Ravens Even the most devoted of God's servants can experience discouragement and exhaustion, allowing their circumstances to overwhelm their daily trust in God. Elijah, a prophet of the northern kingdom of Israel, had been a witness to and a performer of some of the most remarkable miracles recorded in the Bible. Nonetheless, not long after, he succumbed to depression and terror. Jezebel had threatened the life of Elijah. The story begins with King Ahab ascending to the throne of Israel. Now Ahab wasn't exactly the ideal king. The Bible says, Ahab, the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all the kings who were before him. 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30. He even married Jezebel, a princess from Sidon, who was a fervent worshiper of the false god Baal. Together, they led Israel into Baal worship, which really angered God. People believed that if they worshiped Baal, he would make their land fertile. Alongside Baal, there was Asherah, who was seen as Baal's partner. She was like the female version of Baal and was thought to bring fertility too. This kind of worship was different from what the Israelites were supposed to follow according to their covenant with God. That's why prophets like Elijah were so against it. Elijah was sent by God to challenge this whole system and confront the corrupt leadership of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. The situation got intense, especially since Queen Jezebel was a strong supporter of Baal and Asherah worship. Ahab saw Elijah not as a messenger of truth, but as a troubler of Israel. Yet Elijah's boldness in delivering this message was remarkable. He wasn't just speaking to a king, he was challenging an entire belief system. It was a time when believing in God was challenged by the common practice of worshipping idols. The drought that followed was severe. It lasted for years, just as Elijah had said. This wasn't just a meteorological event. It was a spiritual lesson for Israel. The drought mirrored the spiritual dryness in the hearts of the people. Sometimes, it takes a significant event to open our eyes to the truth, to turn us back to the right path. This is what God was doing for Israel. He was calling them back to himself, showing them the futility of idol worship. Elijah's Depression 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4 but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked for himself to die and said, Enough! Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Elijah secluded himself even further, beyond the distant city of Beersheba. We read, And he prayed that he might die, this remarkable man was known for his powerful prayers. He was able to stop the rain and dew for three and a half years with his prayers, and then start them again. However, he prayed for his own death. Fortunately, Elijah's prayer wasn't answered. Sometimes receiving a no from God is better than receiving a yes. We read, It is enough. It seems that Elijah was expressing, I can't do this anymore, Lord. Despite his great work on Mount Carmel, which did not result in a lasting national revival or return to the Lord, the stress and exhausting nature of his job made him feel like he was accomplishing nothing. It's possible that Elijah had hoped that the events on Mount Carmel would change the hearts of Ahab, Jezebel, and the leadership of Israel. However, Elijah may have forgotten that people often choose to reject God despite the evidence presented to them. After examining what seemed like a failure in his work, Elijah immediately blamed himself for being unworthy. 
He believed that the work was unsuccessful because of his own sins and the sins of his ancestors. It's a common misconception that prophets never feel down. But Elijah's story shows that even they experience difficult moments. God's Ministry to the Despairing Elijah Luckily, that's not the end of the story. When God found Elijah, who was not doing well, he didn't abandon him. Instead, the Lord lifted him up, placed him back in the battle, gave him valuable help in the form of the prophet Elisha, and then took him away to heaven in a whirlwind. God ministers to the physical needs of Elijah. 1 Kings chapter 19 verses 5 through 8. Then he lay down and fell asleep under a broom tree. But behold, there was an angel touching him, and he said to him, Arise, eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a round loaf of bread baked on hot coals, and a pitcher of water. So we ate and drank and lay down again. But the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too long for you. So he arose and ate and drank, and he journeyed in the strength of that food for forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. We read, As he lay and slept under a broom tree, this was God's mercy extended to Elijah. Physically, he needed rest and replenishment. God gave him rest under a broom tree and provided miraculous food for replenishment. God first took care of Elijah's physical needs. Although it's not always the case, physical needs are important and sometimes getting enough rest and replenishment can be the most spiritual thing a person can do. How many people are there today who sit under Elijah's juniper, wishing to lay down the heavy burden imposed upon them by the Almighty? We read, So he ate and drank and lay down again. Elijah repeatedly received rest and replenishment from the Lord, as one quick nap and meal weren't enough. Before he corrected his false attitude of fear, he commanded the man to eat, ministering to his physical weakness. The soul needs nourishment, and the body requires sustenance too. Although it may appear trivial, neglecting these necessities can be particularly detrimental to a depressed servant of God. Therefore, we must not overlook the significance of food and rest in truly aiding those in need. God treated his servant Elijah with great grace when he sent him on a 200-mile, 40-day journey to Mount Horeb, also known as Mount Sinai. Instead of rebuking or chastising him, God offered his loving and gentle treatment, which was unexpected. This act of God allowed Elijah to recover from his spiritual slump without any immediate demand for recovery. We, like the prophet Elijah, are human and become exhausted. When our minds and bodies tire, we can become overwhelmed. However, the God who created us, Psalm chapter 103, verse 14, for he himself knows our form. He is mindful that we are nothing but dust. Elijah said, it is enough but it was not really enough for him. God had more blessings in store for him, and Elijah later had a wonderful revelation of God on Mount Horeb. Elijah's later life was one of calm communion with God, and he never had another fainting fit. So, it was not enough for Elijah to just settle for what he had. He had more to enjoy. Only God knows when we have done enough and enjoyed enough, but we do not know. Overcome by the message of the impending drought, the prevalence of idolatry in Samaria, the wrath of King Ahab, and the realization that he couldn't return home, Elijah collapsed to the ground, completely exhausted. 
Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward, and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. God taught Elijah the importance of a private and solitary life through an experience. Elijah had recently gained fame as Ahab's opponent, and his prayers were so powerful that they could cause or stop rain. However, God instructed Elijah to hide and spend time alone with him, even at the peak of his popularity. The word cherith originates from an ancient Hebrew root that means to cut away or cut off. This implies that God had to remove certain things from Elijah's life during that period. It shouldn't come as a surprise when our Heavenly Father tells us to retreat from the hustle and bustle of life. He may ask us to find solace in the cherith of a sick room, the cherith of shattered dreams, the cherith of mourning, or some other peaceful place where the chaos of the world has receded. The escape to the brook Cherith was to teach Elijah to rely on the Lord. During a dry spell, he had to trust that God would keep the brook flowing. He had to accept food from ravens, which were unclean creatures. We read, I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. In this text, there is a strong emphasis on the word cherith. God promised Elijah that he would be fed by the ravens while he stayed at cherith. Although the ravens could feed him anywhere, God specifically directed them to provide for him at cherith. Despite Elijah's potential desire to be elsewhere, preaching or engaged in other activities, God wanted him to be at cherith and assured him that his needs would be met. We read that the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Elijah, a prophet from the Bible, was fed by ravens during a time of famine. However, every morsel of food he received came from the beak of an unclean animal, which taught him to emphasize the spirit of the law rather than the letter of the law. God commanded, and the ravens came. In the story, there's a powerful lesson about God's provision and command. Imagine Elijah sitting alone by the brook Cherith, when suddenly a flock of black ravens swoops in. These aren't just any birds. They're ravens, often seen as unclean scavengers. Yet, they bring bread and meat to Elijah. This wasn't a coincidence or a random act of nature. It was God's command, and the ravens obeyed, becoming unlikely providers for the prophet. Think about this. How much food does a family consume in a week? If you've ever had to feed a growing family, you know it's a lot. Just like Elijah depended on the ravens, Families depend on God's provision, often in ways they don't even realize. God knows what you need, when you need it, and He provides, sometimes in the most unexpected ways. God's command to the ravens was specific. I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 4 This wasn't a general vague hope that Elijah might find food. It was a direct, miraculous intervention by God, using creatures that would normally never serve such a purpose. The ravens, known for scavenging for themselves, were transformed into messengers of God's provision. Now, think about the implications of this. If God can command ravens, considered unclean and self-serving to provide for Elijah, what does that say about his power and care for us? Just as God knew Elijah's location and needs, He knows ours. He knows your name, address, 
and even the details of what you need today and tomorrow. It's all in God's hands because He watches over us, even when we feel forgotten. This story of Elijah and the ravens teaches us about God's miraculous ways of providing. It shows that God can use the most unlikely sources for our benefit. When the Lord commands, even the ravens obey. It's a reminder that God's resources are unlimited and His ways are beyond our understanding. Consider this. As God sent ravens to Elijah, He can command all of heaven to aid us in our needs. This isn't just about physical food. It's about God's ability to provide what we need, when we need it, be it strength, comfort, guidance, or sustenance. The story is a call to trust in God's timing and methods, even when they seem unconventional or unexpected. In a world where we often worry about our next meal or the future, Elijah's story with the ravens stands as a testament to God's unfailing provision. It encourages us to lean not on our understanding, but to trust in God's provision. Can we, like Elijah, trust that God will provide for us, even if it means waiting for ravens by a brook? Can we have faith that God's commands will be fulfilled in our lives in ways we can't imagine? But there is so much to the story of Elijah and the raven that many haven't realized. God did not allow Elijah to hoard up a surplus. God didn't let Elijah store up a bunch of food and supplies, but instead gave him exactly what he needed for each day. This story really shows us what it means to depend on God daily. It's just like what Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer. Give us today our daily bread. Matthew chapter 6 verse 11. This line from the prayer reminds us to trust God for what we need each and every day. Basically, God sent ravens to Elijah twice daily, once in the morning and then again in the evening. These birds didn't bring a week's worth of food on Monday. They brought only enough for each part of the day just enough and nothing more. Have you ever wondered why God chose to provide in such a measured way? This method of provision teaches a crucial lesson about reliance on God. In our lives, we often strive for security through material accumulation. Many of us have freezers full of food, bank accounts for rainy days, insurance policies and investment plans. We like the idea of having enough to not worry about tomorrow. However, this abundance can sometimes make it difficult to sincerely depend on God. It's easier to say a prayer for daily bread without truly feeling its significance when our pantries are full. Life as we know is unpredictable. Our well-laid plans can unravel with a sudden illness, job loss, or other unforeseen crises. These moments of uncertainty are not just challenges. They're opportunities to shift from self-sufficiency to God-sufficiency, from relying on ourselves to trusting in Him alone. This shift is what the story of Elijah and the ravens is all about. Consider the experience of a single mother running her own business. She lives not knowing if she'll have enough work to make ends meet each month. Yet, just as she's about to run out of resources, something comes up and she manages to get by. This constant state of dependence isn't easy, but it teaches a valuable lesson about God's faithfulness in providing for our needs. Now, this doesn't mean we shouldn't plan for the future. Planning is wise and biblical, but there's a fine line between planning and worrying. We are encouraged to prepare, but not to be consumed by anxiety about the future. Charles Spurgeon, a famous preacher, once pointed out that God promises enough, but not in excess. And sometimes, that enough may not come in the way or form we prefer. 
It might be like Elijah's bread and meat delivered by ravens in unconventional and unexpected pieces, but it's still provision. This story, therefore, isn't just about God feeding Elijah. It's a broader lesson on trust and gratitude. It teaches us to appreciate what we receive, however it comes, and to maintain humility, recognizing that we are entirely reliant on God's grace. It reminds us that our daily sustenance, in whatever form it arrives, is a testament to God's ongoing care and provision. So, in our own lives, can we learn to trust in God's day-by-day -day provision as Elijah did? Can we find peace in the understanding that while we may not have everything we want, we will have what we need? The story of Elijah and the ravens calls us to a life of faith and dependence on God, reminding us that our daily bread, however it arrives, is enough. God didn't ask Elijah's permission before he sent the ravens. Imagine being in Prophet Elijah's shoes for a moment. You are sent by God to hide by the brook Cherith, and then you're told that ravens, yes, ravens, will be delivering your meals. Think about it. Elijah wasn't asked if he was okay with this plan. God just made it happen. Why? Because sometimes God's plans are far beyond our understanding or preferences. Ravens, as you might know, aren't exactly the dining companions of choice. They're known more for feasting on decaying flesh than for their delivery services. In the Jewish culture, ravens were seen as unclean. So imagine the surprise, and perhaps feeling a little bit worried or uneasy, when Elijah hears that these birds will be his caterers. It's like being told, come over for some fried raven and mashed potatoes. Most of us would probably make a quick excuse to be anywhere but there. But here's where it gets interesting. The food that the ravens brought wasn't just scraps or bits from a dead animal. No, it was proper food, fit for a prophet. This shows God's creativity and authority. He used an unlikely source, an unclean bird, to provide for Elijah, and not just once or twice, but for potentially over 2,000 meals. That's three and a half years of raven-delivered meals, as James chapter 5 verse 17 indicates, that it didn't rain in Israel for that long, due to Elijah's prayers. You might think, wouldn't it be more logical for God to use a more pleasant bird, like a robin or a dove? But that's not how God works. He often uses the unexpected to achieve his purposes. It's like God is showing us that he can use anything and anyone, no matter how unlikely to provide for his people. This story is a powerful reminder that God's ways are not our ways. As humans, we often expect help to come from the obvious places, maybe a rich relative or a well-off friend. But God doesn't always operate in the obvious. He can use the ravens of the world, the least expected sources to meet our needs. If you find yourself in a Cherith-like situation, a place of hiding or difficulty, remember this story. Just as God had not forgotten Elijah, he hasn't forgotten you. Your needs are known to him, and he has unique ways of meeting them. So, when life sends you to your own Cherith, don't be surprised if your help comes from the most unexpected places. Lesson of Provision God has appointed the beginning and ending of every season of life. This story doesn't just stop at Elijah being fed by the ravens, but in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 7, a significant event occurs. It happened after a while that the brook dried up, because there was no rain in the land. This wasn't a random occurrence. The original Hebrew phrase implies it was at the end of days set by God. 
It's a clear indication that the brook's flow and its cessation were within God's plan. Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases Him. Psalm chapter 115 verse 3 This verse reminds us that every aspect of creation, even the smallest drop of water, is under God's command. The God who brought the rain also brought the drought. He who sent Elijah to confront Ahab also guided him to the solitude by the brook and then to the widow at Zarephath. Elijah's life with its dramatic turns wasn't haphazard, but a display of God's precise orchestration. Think about it. Elijah's journey from the mountains of Gilead to the king's palace to the brook Cherith to a widow's home in Zarephath it might look random, but it's really God's plan happening on purpose. Like Proverbs chapter 16 verse 9 says, A man's mind plans his way as he journeys through life, but the Lord directs his steps and establishes them. This means that even though we plan things, in the end, it's God who decides how everything will happen. Our plans can change quickly just like leaves blowing around in the wind during fall. But what God plans is always sure and never changes. You might talk a lot, set targets and make plans, but in the end, it's God who decides what will happen. Knowing this makes us feel relieved and humble. We don't have the final control. God does. This realization can be liberating. You no longer have to bear the weight of controlling everything or pretending to have all the answers. Like Corey Tenboom, who couldn't sleep because of worries, you might find peace in the truth that God is in control. As she learned, there's no need to stay awake all night in fear. God is already handling it. So, what can we learn from Elijah's story about the seasons of our lives? First, that every phase, every turn, and every change is within God's sovereign plan. The drying up of the brook wasn't a setback, but a transition to the next phase of God's plan for Elijah. Similarly, in our lives, what might seem like an end could just be the beginning of something new that God has ordained. Second, this story teaches us about trust and dependence. Elijah depended on God for his daily needs, and when the brook dried up, he trusted that God had a plan. In our lives, when things don't go as expected, can we, like Elijah, trust that God is leading us to our next season? Finally, this narrative reminds us of God's provision. He provided for Elijah in miraculous ways, and he can do the same for us. Whether it's through ravens or unexpected means, God's provision is often surprising, but always timely. But there is more to this than you can imagine. The Use of Ravens in the Bible Ravens in the Bible are quite fascinating, appearing only a few times, but each instance is packed with meaning. These black birds are often seen in a negative light, yet they play significant roles in biblical narratives. Let's start with Noah's Ark in Genesis chapter 8, verses 6 through 7. After the great flood, Noah sent out a raven to look for dry land. This raven, representing half of the entire raven population at that time, managed to survive by scavenging off the debris floating on the water. Think about it. Even in such a catastrophic event, the raven found a way to live. Ravens are mentioned again in the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 11, where the woman describes her beloved's hair as dark as a raven. Here the raven's dark black color is used to depict beauty, a clear contrast to its usual negative image. But the darker side of ravens is highlighted in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 17, 
where they are said to pickled the eyes of a rebellious child. This grim picture portrays a disobedient child facing a dishonorable end, becoming food for ravens. Similarly, Isaiah prophesies in Isaiah chapter 34 verse 11 about God's judgment on Edom, where the land becomes so barren that only owls and ravens dwell there. Despite their often negative portrayal, the Bible also shows that God cares for ravens. Psalm chapter 147 verse 9 mentions how God feeds them. Jesus, in Luke chapter 12 verse 24, uses ravens to teach an important lesson to his disciples, saying, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow seed nor reap the crop. They have no storehouse or barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than the birds? It's interesting that these birds, usually thought of as a bad sign, are shown as examples of God's care. Now let's delve into a peculiar law from Leviticus chapter 11 verses 13 through 19. God declared ravens, among other birds, as unclean and unfit for consumption by the Jews. This prohibition likely came from their scavenging nature, as they often eat dead flesh. This law not only set dietary boundaries, but also protected the Jewish people. The Return and Victory After a long and terrible drought, Elijah is coming back. The land was very dry, and the people really wanted things to get better. But before anything else, Elijah had to face King Ahab, the one who caused Israel to go the wrong way. Now picture Elijah's return. He had been away, hidden by God during the drought, and now he was back. But why return now? It's as if God's timing is always perfect even when we don't understand it. Elijah's reappearance was a signal that something significant was about to happen. Can you feel the tension? It's a moment charged with accusation and counter-accusation. Elijah challenged Ahab, not with his own words, but with the authority of the Lord. This confrontation wasn't just a personal dispute. It was a clash of ideologies, a battle between the worship of God and the worship of Baal. But Elijah wasn't done yet. He threw down a challenge. Now then send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. 1 Kings chapter 18 verse 19 Imagine the audacity. Elijah was outnumbered, a lone prophet against hundreds. Yet, he was unafraid. Why? Because he knew that with God on his side, numbers didn't matter. Think about that for a moment. How often do we feel overwhelmed by the odds against us? Elijah's story reminds us that it's not about how many are against us, but who is with us? So Ahab called the people and the prophets to Mount Carmel. The stage was set for one of the greatest demonstrations of God's power in the Bible. But before that epic showdown, this confrontation with Ahab set the tone. It was a moment of decision for Israel, a chance to turn back to God. Now as we reflect on the story, let's consider... How do we respond when confronted with the truth? Are we like Ahab, quick to blame others? Or do we listen and heed the call to change? Elijah's boldness in confronting Ahab challenges us to stand firm in our convictions, even when it's uncomfortable or when we stand alone. The story of Elijah and Ahab is more than just an ancient narrative. It's a timeless reminder of the power of truth over falsehood, of light over darkness. As Elijah stood before Ahab that day, 
he stood as a source of hope, a testament to the fact that one person, empowered by God, can make a difference. So let's ask ourselves, in our own lives, how can we be like Elijah? How can we stand for truth, challenge the status quo, and be agents of change in a world that often resembles the idolatrous Israel of Ahab's time? Just as Elijah did, we too can confront the Ahabs of our time with courage, conviction, and faith in the God who never fails. The End of the Drought Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. This wasn't just any prayer. It was a plea full of faith and expectancy. He said to his servant, Go up, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. Elijah said, Go back seven times. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 43. Can you sense Elijah's persistence? He didn't give up. He kept praying, kept believing. Isn't that a lesson for all of us in our times of need? On the seventh time, the servant reported. And at the seventh time, the servant said, A cloud as small as a man's hand is coming up from the sea. And Elijah said, Go up, say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down, so that the rain shower does not stop you. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 44 To others, this might have seemed insignificant, but not to Elijah. He knew this was the answer to his prayers. Elijah's faith was so strong that he didn't just predict rain, he warned of a heavy shower. Soon, the sky grew dark with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy rain. Imagine the relief and joy among the people. The drought had ended, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. But what does this tell us about faith and prayer? The end of the drought was more than just physical relief. It was a powerful demonstration of God's supremacy over nature and false gods. It was a vindication of Elijah's faith and a call for Israel to return to the worship of the true God. Elijah's victory on Mount Carmel is a testament to the power of persistent prayer and unshakable faith. It shows us that no matter how bad things seem, God can help. And if we keep praying, amazing things can happen. This story is an invitation for us to reflect on our own faith. Do we believe that God can work wonders in our lives? Are we persistent in our prayers, even when we don't see immediate results? The story of Elijah's triumph is not just a historical event. It's a beacon of hope and a reminder of God's faithfulness. It's a call to trust in God's timing and power even when our circumstances seem impossible. So, as we face our own droughts, be they physical, emotional, or spiritual, let's remember Elijah's example. Let's hold on to our faith, continue in fervent prayer, and watch for the small clouds on the horizon, knowing that they can herald the beginning of great blessings. The Relevance Today the story of Elijah and the ravens isn't just a historical account. It's a narrative filled with practical timeless lessons. It challenges us to trust in God's provision, to understand the blessings that come with obedience, to choose faith over fear, to balance faith with wisdom, and to depend solely on God. These lessons are as relevant today as they were in Elijah's time. As we reflect on these lessons, let's ask ourselves, how can we apply these principles in our daily lives? In what ways can we strengthen our trust, obedience, faith, wisdom, and dependence on God? Elijah's story 
is a reminder that the teachings of the Old Testament are not just ancient texts. They are living words, guiding us in our journey of faith. Elijah and the Ravens is a clear illustration of God's timing and guidance in our lives. It teaches us that every season, every change has its appointed time by God. At the end, we can have faith to trust God's timing in life's ups and downs, believing that He knows the start and end of every challenge we go through. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we gather today to reflect on the life and teachings of Prophet Elijah and the miraculous encounter with the ravens. In our gathering, we seek to draw inspiration and guidance from this extraordinary moment in biblical history. Lord, we are reminded through Elijah's life of your unending provision and care. As Elijah was sustained in the wilderness by ravens, we pray for your sustenance in our lives. In moments of scarcity and need, help us to trust in your provision, believing that you will provide for us as you did for Elijah. Give us the faith to rely on you, even when the path ahead seems uncertain and our resources limited. We pray for courage and strength, as exemplified by Elijah. In a time when he stood alone, bravely confronting the prophets of Baal. Grant us the courage to stand for what is right and true in our own lives. May we be bold in our faith, unafraid to speak your truth in the face of opposition or apathy. Dear God, just as you send ravens to feed Elijah, send us opportunities to be your hands and feet in this world. Inspire us to care for those in need, to extend our resources and our hearts to those who are hungry, thirsty, and seeking refuge. Help us to be instruments of your provision, sharing what we have with a generous and loving spirit. We seek wisdom, Lord, as we navigate the complexities of our lives. Elijah's journey was not without its challenges and moments of pain. In times of doubt and hardship, guide us with your wisdom. Grant us the discernment to make choices that align with your will and lead us closer to you. Teach us, O oh God, to be still and listen for your voice in the midst of the noise and distractions of our world. Elijah encountered you, not in the earthquake, wind, or fire, but in a gentle whisper. Help us to find quiet moments in our busy lives to hear your gentle guidance, to feel your calming presence, and to know your deep abiding love. We pray for a spirit of humility, following Elijah's example. Despite his powerful experiences and his role as a prophet, Elijah knew the importance of humility while being in your presence. In our achievements and successes, keep us humble, always remembering that our gifts and opportunities come from you. Lord, we ask for resilience in the face of trouble. As Elijah faced great trials and even fled for his life, he continued to trust in you. When we encounter trials of our own, give us the resilience to endure the faith to persevere, and the hope that you are with us always. We pray for the healing of our world, just as Elijah worked towards the healing of his. In times of division, conflict, and pain, use us as agents of reconciliation and peace. Help us to build bridges where there are walls, to bring light where there is darkness, and to spread love where there is hatred. Finally, we thank you, God, for the gift of community. Just as Elijah was not alone, eventually finding Elisha and others who shared his faith, remind us that we are part of a greater community of believers. Strengthen our bonds with one another, that we may support, encourage, 
and uplift each other in our journey of faith. We offer up these prayers and reflections, inspired by the life of Prophet Elijah and the ravens that ministered to him. May we learn from his faith, be strengthened by his courage, and be guided by his commitment to your will. We ask all these things in your holy name. Amen. Our question of the day. When was the last time you felt appreciated? Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from us and be sure to subscribe and hit the bell to find out about our latest videos. Just videos. Just videos.